Hello dear students. In today's lecture, we are going to cover a rather unique and rare uh, type of uh, injury that uh, maxillofacial surgeons encounter. Uh, we call it rare because it usually involves um, hardly maybe 10, 8 to 10 percent of the total cases that we ever see. And what makes it, what makes it unique is that Usually the fracture patterns that we see in these kind of fractures is something that you don't see in conventional fractures. So students, today we are going to cover complex mid-face and pan-facial fractures. What you have to understand here is that when we talk about pan-facial fractures, there is really no predictable pattern of injury here. Like you see in your uh, classical leaf foot fractures or classical zygomatic complex fractures or classical mandible fractures. We have uh, our lines of fractures. We have even maybe segmentalization of the of occlusion. But yet, uh, more or less, whatever we have seen in the past is quite well defined. Because of that, it becomes easy to establish treatment protocols uh, which help us to make standardized uh, treatments so that we can achieve uh, predictable results in most of our patients. However, panfacial fractures are those fractures in which because there is an absence of any predictable fracture pattern, hence the management even till date remains mainly operator dependent. It is mainly instinctual. Uh, depending on the level of expertise or the level of exposure of the clinician, how many fracture patterns of these kind he has treated in the past, he or she has treated in the past. And really, there is no way how we can measure uh, the, the final treatment outcomes uh, between one institution to the other. Hence, it becomes very important to understand the concepts in the management of facial fractures, uh, the actual way how reduction, uh, fixation uh, and immobilization are actually used to treat facial fractures. So, as I said before, what defines panfacial fractures? It is not isolated lower, middle or upper upper face fractures which will come under the purview of panfacial fractures. The word to be seen here is simultaneously. So whenever there is a simultaneous involvement of the lower, middle and upper face which includes the mandible, the leafoot level, leafoot one levels, uh, the zygomatic complex levels, the nasoorbitoethmoid fractures, the frontal bone involvement, and probably even the cranial vault involvement is what comes under the purview of panfacial fractures. Now you can clearly see that because all these regions are involved simultaneously, therefore the level of injury is very high and they are often associated with surgical emergencies such as craniocerebral injuries and even cervical spine injuries. Now the pattern of injury varies with the vector, the speed and the instrument of impact as has been pointed out by many authors in the past. Right. So, what needs to be seen here is that panfacial fractures are usually caused by impact from very high energy trauma, high energy mechanisms and have the characteristics, as I said before, which are beyond that are seen in more conventional fracture patterns. Now, such high energy forces directed at the craniofacial region, they also result in secondary vectors of injury and countercope injuries, which necessitates a high degree of suspicion for other injuries. And by other injuries, I mean injuries involving other body organs. So, as we, as we saw uh, in a study that was published by Abdul Rahman in the International Journal of Surgery in 2018, uh, they found that almost 78% of the cases out of the 200 were secondary to road traffic accidents, out of which mostly were motorcycle accidents. And uh, uh, 
a little less uh, from motor car accidents and also uh, they were also secondary to firearm injuries and falling from height so what were the associated injuries most commonly seen a very high percentage of cases involved neurosurgery as we said craniocerebral trauma and cervical spine injuries also orthopedic injuries made a very large percentage so you may have femur fractures you may have distal extremity fractures you may have uh, other fractures of the orthopedic skeleton then abdominal injuries and thoracic as well as ocular injuries were also components of these kind of fractures so when we talk about high energy trauma what do we mean high energy trauma means high energy transfer so that means the impact of the trauma was not of a low energy kind like probably a pedestrian walking on the road and be, being hit by a slowly moving vehicle and falling down and hitting his jaw on the on the pavement well, that will come probably under the purview of a low energy trauma whereas a high energy trauma would be a high speed accident probably at a speed of anything beyond 60 70 80 miles per hour and having a head on collision with another vehicle or maybe ramming the vehicle into the divider or probably a fall from a very great height in which finally the the body hit the uh, the ground at a at a reasonably high speed so what happens is as you can see in the lower uh, energy transfer you have typical fracture patterns you have predictable fracture lines and predictable injuries the injuries are almost localized there will be minimal soft tissue involvement and you have a high incidence of low condylar fractures whereas in high energy transfers you have a highly unpredictable fracture pattern you have multiple organ involvement that is why the prognosis becomes equally poor and often there's a cross soft tissue involvement and probably aversion also it is usually associated with intracapsular fractures because of the level of engine uh, the, the level of energy transfer and also it is associated with systemic injuries now what are the features that are commonly seen in panfacial traumas so usually you will have uh, the etiology which would be a motor vehicle collision or a gunshot wound or a fall from height they incorporate almost 4 to 10 percent of all facial fractures and 80 percent of them will have some sort of a condylar fracture whether it is extracapsular or intracapsular they are most likely to involve comminuted and avulsed segments and are associated with significantly lower glasgow coma scales with an average of 10 or less than that as compared to low velocity traumas and a very high hospital complication rate of almost as as large as 18 percent and most importantly they may have a 20 percent chance of cervical spine injuries so it is very important to rule out these uh, these kind of injuries before we initiate any sort of further treatment for these patients so in order to understand how the uh, fracture patterns work and how the treatment progresses it's important to first understand what are the support structures of the facial skeleton so as you can see here this is a lighted skull you can see that there are areas of facial bones which are very light and there are areas which are very dark so you can see here that the, the face is made up of vertical as well as horizontal buttresses uh, where the bone is thicker to neutralize the forces applied to it now usually how i explain it to the students is to correlate this with how the a building is constructed I, I i'm sure at some point you may have come across um, some new building that has been constructed in your vicinity and you may have seen that it's usually the, never the walls that are made first it's always a structure which is built first that structure is in the form of vertical uh, pillars and horizontal beams which are made of concrete reinforced with uh, with steel uh, uh, and uh, uh, these are basically what make the structure uh, able to withstand very high forces and very uh, and it is made up of very high high uh, uh, strength materials 
and once the structure is made the intervening walls and partitions can either be laid with brick or maybe glass or maybe any other material which is really that not that in uh, not that consequential because the main load of the building is being borne by these vertical pillars and horizontal beams now correlate that to the facial skeleton similar to these pillars and beams we have these structures which are called buttresses so we have vertical buttresses and the horizontal buttresses and reduction and fixation of these buttresses always make the key areas for the maxillofacial reconstruction so as you can see here there are numerous buttresses which will be outlined again so here we see that vertical buttresses include the nasomaxillary the zygomatico maxillary the pterygomaxillary and the condyle and the posterior mandible horizontal buttresses include the frontal the zygomatic the maxillary and the mandibular buttresses and the central mid face we have to always remember is an area of weakness in which the horizontal buttress support and is, and is especially prone to decreased projection after injury we'll get to this in detail as the lecture proceeds so now what do we say when we talk about vertical and projection so basically vertical is the entire supra inferior length of the face and the projection is the antero posterior projection of the face so as we can see here in this fracture usually it is the slope of the cranial vault or the or the skull base around which the fracture displacement usually happens so as you can see here the nasal bowl has bone has fractured and it has turned superiorly the posterior maxilla has gone down and you are having a, a premature posterior contact of the uh, of the teeth which has created an anterior open bite you have various other things also like for example as we said there is a posteriorly a downward migration of the maxilla which is causing a premature contact of the posterior teeth thereby causing an anterior open bite you can see at the frontozygomatic suture again there is a inferior sort of a min minimal inferior displacement which is again led to the elongation of the face also now you can see that there is a telescoping at the level of the zygomatic arch where it meets meet, meets the body of the zygoma now this telescoping has caused the face to be projected posteriorly that is that means that the antero posterior projection of the face is not what it used to be earlier because there is an overlapping in this segment right and it is highlighted here very clearly also the other aspect that we have to consider is the width and the projection of the face so as you can see here in this diagram there is a fracture of the left zygomatic arch now you see the difference see the difference between the maximum point of the zygomatic arch from the midline there is such a lot a lot of difference between the two sides and this means that the patient's face has widened on one side right so when you see the patient it appears to be wider than it originally was also as you can see here that on one side the the prominence of the zygoma is well maintained whereas on the other side where it is broken it is displaced posteriorly now this has caused a difference in the projection of the face on that side right so antero posteriorly there is a discrepancy right so then what would be the ideal treatment for panfacial fractures as we have Uh, established that there are no set fracture patterns there is no anatomical basis or foundation where you can start to decide where you want to build up from but some of the ideal goals of treatment remain the same that is to restore the pre injury form and function to precisely reduce uh, to uh, cause the hard tissue repair and also the, the soft tissue re drip has to be precise it is very essential to have a seal between the cranial cavity and the upper digestive tract because sometimes these fractures can be associated with base of skull fractures as well 
so uh, if, if 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 it is not handled properly the patient may have persistent uh, uh, retrograde infections which are going from the uh, lower part of the aero uh, uh, digestive tract and going into the uh, into the cranial cavity also you have to have a proper orbital volume restoration the nasal form has to be established with an intact nasal airway and of of course at the end it need to have a correct jaw relation with proper occlusion so that patient can chew in a proper way so what are the principles of reconstruction so we have to prioritize the function and preservation of brain vision and hearing the open fractures should be stabilized as soon as possible for osseous health the support framework uh, until final reconstruction can take place we have to preserve the integrity and health of overlying soft tissues and subunits which are the neurovascular and ductal elements usually the nasolacrimal duct or the front nasal duct are involved in, may be involved in these kind of fractures the cranial nerves as well as the lacrimal system fracture planning planning has to be precise grafting yes it may or may not be needed when there is a gross loss of bony tissue then bone grafting or soft tissue grafting may also be needed and also there has to be a final soft tissue reconstruction right so historically how the man, how were the pan facial fractures managed so um, when the treatments were not so advanced they were these kind of fractures were usually dealt with conservatively because people really didn't know how to go about managing now conservative management including only intermaxillary fixation and leaving the patient like that uh, posed significant post operative problems they led to malocclusion significant increase in the facial width the decreased facial projections which led to very uh, unsightly and uh, unesthetic uh, outcomes for the patient and also a lot of secondary deformities of the face it was only in the early in the 80s and the early 90s that craniofacial surgeons they established the principles of wide exposure and direct visualization for the fracture alignment for actual uh, for accurate craniofacial bone reduction and when these uh, principles were in, applied the the sequence of alignment restoration was significantly in, uh, in influenced um, and we had authors like manson and cross uh, who who really worked hard in the in the late 80s and early 90s and published a lot of literature pertaining to this topic so the concepts of facial buttresses they were uh, they were defined very clearly um, the touching of the frontal bone was started because early surgeons were probably a little wary on touching the, uh, the 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 part of the facial structure skeleton which was involving the cranium the cranial cavity and uh, it usually it initially led to the development of the top to bottom se uh, sequence of the uh, of the reduction of pan facial fractures we will be discussing that more in detail so the advent of rigid internal fixation uh, was probably one of the most important factors that that uh, changed the concept of maxillofacial reconstruction so uh, with the with the with, with the with the ease and of use and uh, uh, more knowledge into the area uh, mandibular condylar fractures were also being uh, dealt with uh, at a more um, uh, you know um, uh, uh, higher percentage of cases more surgeons were, were getting trained to open up these um, anatomically difficult areas to achieve better results and since it was the condyles which determined the posterior facial height uh, it, it 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 really made uh, the use of mandible uh, as the first bone to be uh, to be uh, to be uh, fixated and then the rest of the facial skeleton being built up on that foundation um, uh, leading to the popularity of a bottom to top, top sequence uh, in the management of pan facial fractures so what are the various sequences of pan facial fractures that we usually uh, see so as we said that as there are no clear classifications for pan facial bone fractures so various sequences of reduction like bottom to top top to bottom inside out and outside in uh, have been used either isolated or in combination to restore the facial contour so the essential principle is working from a known or stable area 
that is an area of less displacement or combination and proceeding to a unknown area to make proper reduction more manageable and achievable this is the essential principle behind the management of these fractures so what we see is that in general there are two philosophies which compete with each, with each other that is either the top to down which is starting with the reduction and the fixation at the level of the calvarium and working in a caudal direction or an inferior direction or the bottom up which is the re-establishment of the maxillomandibular unit first as the major step of the sequencing of fractures. So, when do we have the outside in sequence also in which the starting of the panfacial reconstruction was always started with the initiated with the uh, reconstruction zygomatic arch and the mela projection to establish the outer, outer facial frame and to provide the facial width and projection before the naso orbitoethmoid or maxillary and mandibular in, uh, reconstruction was started. A lot of uh, authors also said that it was the FZ suture line which was which should be the first to be reduced in panfacial fractures because it is an important area which determines the facial width and projection. Now, contrary to that, there is the inside out sequence in which the medial frontal bone could be used as a starting point to manage the multiple fracture segments and the frontal bone being a strong bone um, uh, it provided the support needed for reducing the nasomaxillary and the supraorbital rim buttresses so what about, what are the more commonly used technique these days so top to bottom and outside in sequences still remains one of the most popular techniques what do we do in this in this we will first start from the calvarium and then go down systematically as in we will use the frontal bone as the basis from where we will start our anatomic reduction. So in this we first address any significant calvarial frontal sinus and orbital roof defects. Right. Then as a foundation uh, of the calvarium we progress down to the left leafwoods. So then the zygomas are uh, positioned in the proper three dimensional uh, uh, orientation and the lateral wall of the orbit is lined up with the greater wing of the sino sphenoid a proper alignment of the zygomatic arch is achieved right uh, and the orbital rim is achieved so so, uh, so that the reduction can be taken further clearly and the next step is the reconstruction of the mid face across the leaf out one fracture level right so from what makes it this uh, popular is that from an aesthetic point of view, even if there is a minimal mal uh, malalignment at the level of the uh, leafwort one, it is not as noticeable as a malalignment at the level of the orbits. And the last fractures to be generally reconstructed in this technique would be the orbital walls and the orbital floors. And now by the orbital walls, we mean the medial orbit, orbital wall and the orbital floor. So once we have achieved the fixation till the level of the leaf out one, we do we put the patient now in maxillomandibular fixation, and any condylar fracture and mandibular fractures are then treated, and final occlusion is checked at the last. The decides whether to leave the patient in intermaxillary fixation or not. That all depends on how much bone and how much stability we have been able to achieve after putting our rigid internal fixation the plates and screws now coming to the second more uh, accepted uh, treatment uh, sequence which is the bottom up in which we use the maxillomandibular unit as the first major of uh, first major step in the sequencing so what happens here we have various scenarios now over here in scenario one, what, what we see is that there is a fraction of a typical leaf foot uh, type, but there is no sagittal split of the palate and there is no mandibular fracture in these kind of panfacial traumas. So what we can do is we will establish the maxillomandibular unit, which is fairly simple because we use the mandible as a guide uh, as well as the maxilla. They, the teeth fit uh, nicely with each other. And then uh, we proceed with the further treatment from inferior superior now what would be a second scenario now in this 
Suppose we have a leaf foot fracture. There is still no societal split of the palate or mandible fracture. Uh, um, and, and mandibular fracture is present. So the establishment of the correct mandibular arch can be obtained by using the intact maxillary arch. So even though mag mandible arch is fractured, but maxillary arch is intact because it does there is no sagittal split of the palate. So we can fit nicely fit the mandibular teeth according to the maxillary teeth, put the patient into intermaxillary fixation, and then further start with our uh, fixation, right? In scenario three, what happens is that there is a leaf foot type fracture along with a sagittal split of the palate a sagittal split of the palate but there are no mandibular fractures so what we mean is that essentially the mandibular arch is intact now that mandibular arch can be used to fix the two maxillary segments into occlusion thus restoring the maxillomandibular continuity and then we can start proceeding with our internal fixation right scenario four what makes the worst case scenario in which there is a leaf type fracture and a societal split of the palate as well together with mandibular fracture therefore we don't have any guide at all as to how the teeth need to be fixed because the width of both the arches that is the maxilla as well as the mandible has been disrupted what do we do in this case, the surgeon must reconstruct one dental arch by putting plates and screws arbitrarily and then use that as a template to reconstruct the uh, other arch. Now, it, all, it will all depend on which arch is more comminuted and more broken and the lesser one is always chosen to be the template. Right. So, how do we do this? Uh, we can either begin by simple anatomic reduction or by using model surgery application of splits so if the mandible is used to be to position the maxilla through maxillary mandibular fixation the mandible must be completely reconstructed from one condyle to the other that is the only way we will be able to establish a proper vertical as well as a proper width of the mandible that is the intergonial distance can be fixed in this kind of a situation and then maxilla can be fitted according to that all right so and second then we will put the occlusion so these are the various plans and uh, uh, model surgeries which can be done to establish a proper orientation okay so which is more popular the bottom to top outside in approach is most widely used method in the pan in treatment of pan facial bone fractures and according to the bottom up outside in approach the reduction and repair of the fractures are begun from the mandible to the frontal bone followed by the zygomatic complex maxilla and the nasoorbital orbitoethmoid region some authors have have said what is the rationale behind the behind fixing the mandible first so what was concluded is that since mandible is an isolated bone of the facial region and it de determines the height of the lower face by the ramus region and the width of the uh, uh, face by the body region. So as part of the TMJ, the condyle affects the mouth opening and the function of the TMJ also. Therefore, the treatment of the condyle benefits the restoration of both mandibular width and mid direction. So, having achieved an excellent contact between the segments from both labial buccal and lingual segments before and during fixation of mandible fractures is important because even minimal defects would increase the width of the lower face, uh, resulting in much abnormal occlusion and leading to improper management of the maxillary fracture. Now, there is a paradox here. What do we do in cases where we have bilateral condylar fracture? In these cases, there was an author, um, uh, Pau et al., who suggested that inverting the order of repair, starting with the mandibular symphysis, will be much better. So, because the symphysis will make a better and more stable area of fixation from where the rest of the mandibular as well as the facial skeleton repair can be proceeded in a much more systematic and predictable way. Okay, so what are the soft tissue considerations in these fractures? Reapproximation of the periosteum and resuspension of the musculoepineurotic envelope are highly critical for the restoration of form and function after injury. The facial suspensory ligaments that exist in the face 
that have been defined as the zygomatic, mesenteric, and mandibular slings that add significant support to the superficial muscular neurotic system and specifically areas which need where we need to obtain deep closure and resuspension are the orbital rims the lateral canthus the malar eminence the mentalis muscle and the deep temporal field as i said earlier outcome analysis is something which is very very uh, less reported in literature because frankly speaking there have not been any large sample studies multi multi institutional studies in which a lot of cases have been studied and reported and um, proper treatment protocols and sequencing of treatment um, has been established no the, it, it is unfortunate but still because of the rarity of these kind of fractures it becomes really impossible to to make sequencing protocols so that the outcomes can match over different institutions however there are certain factors which we can still consider when we talk about the outcome analysis so basically the face outline should be as much back to normal uh, without the need for any additional surgery for correction it's absolutely mandatory that occlusion should be returned to the pre-trauma levels without the need for additional surgery a mouth opening of more than 35 mm is always desirable and a tmj function which is normal and stable is also desirable and the need for no additional surgery for secondary local deformities such as that of the orbit or the mesoid point region as well as the facial nerve injuries and localized bone defects should again form a very important uh, 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 parameter when it comes to the outcome analysis hmm. So what are the various complications that can be associated with fan facial fractures? As we said, uh, a loss of projection and height issues are one of the most complicated areas. So say, let's talk, let's talk about the frontal bone. If there is a supraorbital communication and post-operative flattening, it may need a primary bone grafting. Otherwise, the area may not be amenable for repair. The nasoethmoid uh, orbitoethmoid region always undergoes combination because of the because the, these bones are so thin and so fragile and if they they are they are they are met they if they meet with high velocity trauma they usually end up in in very very small fragments and hence uh, primary bone grafting may be a mandatory step in, without which you may not be able to achieve a proper nasal width and you may end up with a, tra a traumatic telecanthus Similarly, for the zygomatic arch, a post-operative lateral displacement or bowing under function can occur because of the pull of the masseter muscle. Therefore, the surgeon needs to divide, decide whether he needs heavier plating to support and withstand the forces of medication. The zygomatic but zygomatic maxillary buttress can collapse, and therefore, pan primary bone grafting will be essential in this region. Otherwise, there will be a complete loss of both the vertical as well as the anteroposterior projection of the mid face. Now, in maxilla and mandible, when the alveolar components are involved, it can lead to malocclusion leading to anterior open bite due to posterior mandibular foreshortening or elongation of the posterior maxilla, as we had seen in the CT scan earlier. So, we have to ensure that there is a proper condylar ramer proportion and stability and adequate maxillary disimpaction has been done before fixation. Now, what are the facial width issues? Again, in the mandible, splaying of the lingual cortex of the symphysis and ramal region can cause an increase in the intragonial width, which uh, can lead to excessive facial widening and leads to a very unesthetic outcome of the patient. So, exposure of the inferior cortex to visualize the lingual cortex with the medializing force applied at the angles when we are doing the uh, rigid internal fixation is absolutely essential in, kind, in these kind of situations. In the maxilla, if, the, if there are commun comminuted fra fracture fragments or multiple dentoalveolar uh, segments, plating of the palate or diastasis directly can be used. That could be probably the only solution in order to be able to achieve a proper width of the, uh, of the maxilla. And a model surgery and a surgical splint fabrication are really helpful then in these kind of uh, uh, situations so again for zygomas improper reduction that is medial or lateral displacement can have can cause a havoc when it comes to the facial width and uh, uh, the interzygomatic width can become so large 
uh, or, or so flat that the patient have may be left with um, highly significant uh, post-operative uh, cosmetic deformities. So visualization and fixation at the frontozygomatic suture is essential in these kind of situations. And as, as I said, nasoorbitohythmoid telecanthus or widening of the nasal roof is probably one of the most commonly seen uh, end complication in uh, pen facial traumas. So canthopexy, transnasal wiring and bone grafting are essential in these, primary bone grafting is essential in these situations. So to conclude, pan facial fractures still remain uh, as probably you can say um, the most difficult fractures and probably require the entire expertise and wisdom that a clinician has gathered over his years of experience in order to be able to give a good result. However, recent advances in the man management of facial trauma has enabled us to uh, do a much more accurate restoration of facial form and function. So, you what you need to understand is that you need an organized yet flexible approach. Uh, there is no really one approach which you can use as in a top to, to bottom outside in that you will stick to it. No, depending on the situation, you may have to be flexible and use some other uh, means. At the end of the day, you need to have the best result for the patient. So, although the order of the repair is not that critical, results are optimized if facial width and projection are prioritized after occlusion and stable adjacent buttresses have been established. And when bony reduction and fixation has been completed, the re-establishment of soft tissue relationship is vital in order to have uh, lesser post-operative cosmetic deformities. So, these are my references. These are some of the articles which are I can very easily say that are probably one of the, uh, these are the gems of uh, uh, maxillofacial trauma and reconstruction. So probably if you, all of you can try to get a hand of uh, all these articles, it will be very nice. Thank you everyone for your patient listening.